Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. For inhumanity, there's never been a century like it. 58 million people died in the slaughter of two world wars. Stalinist Russia killed 20 million of its own people. It's estimated that Mao killed about 40 million in China. The Nazis killed 6 million Jews. 2 million people were killed in Vietnam. 3 million in Korea. And in 1994 in Rwanda, 1 million ordinary people were suddenly turned on and killed by their neighbours. And all the while in this bloody century, the private and individual murder of one human being by another has risen inexorably. What are the conditions that allow man to be inhuman to man on such a scale? And can a scientific study of the mind ever uncover the roots of inhumanity or evil? I'm joined by Jonathan Glover, a philosopher and director of the Centre of Medical Law and Ethics at King's College London. His new book, Humanity, A Moral History of the 20th Century, has prompted this discussion. And Dr Gwen Adshead, whose main job is as a consultant psychiatrist at Broadmoor Special Hospital, and she's written several books on ethics. Jonathan Glover, people were very optimistic about humanity at the start of this century. What was the basis for their optimism? Well, I think the in Europe, at least, there had been a 100 or so years of largely unbroken peace since the Napoleonic Wars. People believed that human beings were progressing, were making moral progress. People believed there was a moral law that we all said we all knew how we should behave. And it was thought that barbarism was a thing of the past we were gradually growing out of. Do you think those conditions now appear, before we get into the trench, do you think those conditions now appear almost freakish? Yes, I think they do. I think that it isn't true that the 20th century is unique in barbarism. Barbarism has disfigured all of human history with a few isolated, calm bits. We do seem to have stepped up the pace, though. Well, that quite a lot is technology, I believe. Mm. A few people can decide something which results in vast numbers of people being killed, often far away. But can we just come back to the beginning of the century to set the scene, first of all? Was it the sort of the rule, imperial rule of of the British and uh, uh, the the Navy ruling the waves, the American Constitution, America being allowed to develop peacefully in all sorts of ways and so on? Were there any key factors in that hundred years which just sort of gave people a feeling at the end of the 19th, early 20th century, as you said, that barbarism had been confined to the museum and so on? Well, I think it was really just that the settlement at the end of the Napoleonic Wars had lasted really pretty well. I mean, there had been the Franco-Prussian War, and there was a lot of bloodshed in colonial conquests and colonial wars. But I think it was basically that the political settlement had lasted, and then there are reasons why it started to disintegrate at the beginning of the 20th century. Now, it's difficult to distinguish, although you say that all centuries have known their barbarism, including the 19th century, although not much in Europe. And I agree with that. But by any body count factor, and it's not just technology, I think we can dispute that, the 20th century has been particularly barbarous. It's difficult to know where to start from. You look at Stalin and Mao and Rwanda and so on, but the Holocaust is... I'll come to Gwen in one moment, but in, it, one of the things that people are still puzzling about is the Holocaust involved so many, in heavy quotes, ordinary people, unquote, on the German side, who then uh, committed what we can still scarcely speak of as atrocities. Now, can we tack- how did they overcome what could have, could have been called their, their restraints to do that? Well, I think there are a number of different ways. One was that there was a system of belief which said that the Jews were to blame for the defeat in the First World War. Hitler and his followers tended to believe in the stab in the back theory, and particularly that the Jews had done this stab in the back. Second, there was very powerful propaganda, which dehumanised the Jews, so that it was easy to... There were films showing Jews looking particularly horrible, uh, with intercut with shots of rushing hordes of rats, for instance. So there was a, a build-up of dehumanisation and hatred. There was also the segregation of the Jews. They were firstly removed and then killed later. Then there was the trampling on their dignity. One of the great protective barriers is respect for people's dignity and the humiliations imposed upon the Jews. I mean, when the Nazis took over Vienna, the Jews being forced to scrub the streets with toothbrushes amid jeering SS men. Uh, These humiliations removed the barrier of respect for people's dignity. Then again, there was the fragmentation of responsibility. Every person thought that they were only a cog in a machine. 
this person is only arranging the train timetable, this person is only arresting them and taking them to somewhere else where they're going to go, this person is only supplying some gas for a camp, and so on. So are these... Then was, was this accretion? I come back to that in a second. But Gwen answered, "Do you find any response in what Jonathan Glover said in the individual patients you deal with in Broadmoor? Do you find any connection there between what we're talking about is a mass mm. event and what we're talking about with you as individual people who have committed wicked and even evil?" Acts. Very much so. Uh, I think that I suppose the best analogy that I can draw um, is something between, uh, I suppose, the uh, a melody played on an individual instrument and uh, a, a taken up and elaborated by an orchestra. When uh, that that sort of distinction between the individual and the sort of larger group, because I think that one of the many of the themes that you've just outlined about a sort of gradual process of dehumanisation, a sort of whittling away gradual humiliations, are things that I certainly see not only sometimes in the histories of the people that I work with who have committed acts of uh, literally sometimes unspeakable violence, but also in terms of sometimes what they what they what they have actually done. I mean, I think I think. One of the things, well, one of the things I'm very struck by when I'm working with individuals is all the devices that they use to try and make it all right for them to have done what they've done, because most people that all the people that I'm working with are struggling to live in a way with what, with what they've done, and that's true as much in prisons. I, I used to be a visiting psychiatrist at, at, at one of the British prisons, and, and and I think it's just as true for, for ordinary prisons as well in the special hospital. And, and and what I'm always struck by is the individual trying to make sense of what he's done, and what I hear in their stories, and what they say often when they're arrested on remand, is a, a hist- is often a, a quite recognisable script, rather like what you've been saying, Jonathan, about I only did this. The victim was really much more blameworthy than than it appears. It, it's all it's all the, it's, it's like a small scale version of what you've been describing. So you think that the individual can be translated into the mass without something else happening? That's one of the things that fascinates me. Is mass behaviour uh, a different? Do different uh, rules, do different qualities uh, apply when we're talking about mass behaviour? It, it, I, I agree with you. I think it is. It is the most interesting thing, uh, really, is about some some. That something what happens between the gap between the individual and the group. I mean, I, I'm a I'm a group therapist by by training, so I'm particularly interested in how groups work together. And I run groups in the hospital where I, where I work. And and I think what's interesting is to look at what are the sort of dynamics that happen between a group of individuals when you get them together as a group. And there's been quite a lot written actually about what happens to people when you put them in a large group. And I think there's a question in my mind about whether there's something about very large groups. Um, very large communities that can actually link, that actually respond to this question of conformity that you raise in your book, for example, and the Milgram experiments and, and, and so forth, about how people who can respond with conformity and only obeying orders and it's not really my responsibility. I wonder if there is something about individuals joining groups that does seem to, you can lose your responsibility in a larger group. Jonathan, what do you see the connection between researching the individuals and does that give you enough? Does that, is that a good source of information for talking about what's happened to masses of people involved in this thing? I think it's a good source but a partial source. And I think in, in order to understand the Nazis, it is actually illuminating to look at the sort of upbringing that the leading Nazis and the people who ran the camps had. They were given horrendously authoritarian, disciplinarian-type upbringings, the exact opposite of the sort of upbringing that the people who bravely rescued Jews in Poland, for instance, characteristically had, where they were encouraged to have a morality based on sympathy and reasoning and discussion rather than obedience and conformity. But the individual psychopathology can't, I think, be the whole story, Mm. because, as you said, it's a matter of... um, often ordinary people who haven't had any special horrible upbringing who, one way or another, participate in terrible atrocities. And I think one of the things that normally restrains people, I mean, it's not by any means the only thing, but normally restrains people in everyday life from committing atrocity is simply group pressure. And in some societies, the group pressure works the other way. In some societies, the pressure is against you. You're you're stigmatized if you help a Jew. Or in the Chinese Cultural Revolution, you help a reactionary. You're stigmatized. And that sort of pressure makes people conform. The, you, uh, I enjoyed the book very much indeed, and you, you, you referred to Aristotle at one stage. 
He said, virtue is cultivated uh, by the practice of virtuous acts, and the opposite is true. Vice can be cultivated, that's the word, strengthened, encouraged by the practice of wicked acts, I presume. Yes. I think there's uh, a lot to Aristotle's remark. I think that very often people start to behave in a way they do because they're conforming, because they're under social pressures, and then they rationalise it and it becomes a habit which they justify. And, and the, acquisition of the acquisition of virtue and pro-social behaviours is a developmental task, I think, that children do engage in. And you can see, you can see the tension between virtuous and vicious behaviour in, 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 very, in very young children, really from, very, from early, early age, as early as 18 months. And there's some very nice research that shows how children acquire more virtuous behaviour and, indeed, about ones who acquire more antisocial behaviour and demonstrate that. And I th but I, th I think... I mean, how they acquire it, it's by nurture, it's, it's by teaching an it, example. It's, it's, it's main, it seems to be mainly by nurture that there's, there's doesn't, there doesn't seem to be really any convincing evidence for a gene for either antisocial behaviour or, indeed, for virtue. Mm. Um, and and I think, but I think the, by far the most important impact is is something about, about environment. But I think the other, I mean, the, the, the relevant point here, I think, I suppose, is that development doesn't stop in childhood. People continue to develop throughout adulthood, and I, I think that this may help us to understand how it is that a, that a community, a political community, could get itself, could lose its moral identity, perhaps in the way that happened in Nazi Germany. I mean, I think if you, I mean, I think Victor Klemperer's diaries, um, the second volume which has just been published, they're, they're a fascinating account of what it was to be a Jew in Dresden, and, to, and the gradual, as you say, the gradual accretion, the gradual diminution of identity there. Can I turn from, as it were, a, a Holocaust to, to a Russian example? Again, taking something from your book, uh, Jonathan, which is full of, which is full of uh, uh, marvellous things from yourself and from, from other people. There's this quotation from Solzhenitsyn where he's talking about the, uh, the, a question which again seems to me to be sensible, central and, and rather a kind that anybody could do these things, that we're all capable of doing these things. Solzhenitsyn seems to reinforce that. He says, if only, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, if only it weren't necessary only to separate them from the rest of us, but the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. It is, after all, only because of the way things worked out that they were the executioners and we weren't. <laughs> directly contradicted by another quote from you from, uh, from um, Primo Levi, which is saying, to confuse them with their victims is a moral disease. Now, I'm on Levi's side there. I think that everybody's capable of, 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 of all sorts of evil. Is I don't think it's accurate. It's some kind of cop-out. What do you think? Well, I am roughly on the same side as you, but I think it's a bit more complicated. As Primo Levi says, it does no service to truth to pretend that everybody is the same. There are real differences between those who were Nazis and those who were their victims. Mm. And as he says, it does no service to truth just to blur the distinction. But all the same, uh, I think that it's in part a matter of the good fortune or bad fortune of the kind of upbringing you've had when young, for instance, and other factors that makes the difference. The kind of person you are makes a difference to whether you participate in atrocities or not. But, lots of but people the kind of person you are is, in, in, in turn, partly the product of factors outside your own control. But lots of people can have authoritarian upbringings. I mean, many people in this country, Britain, uh, had very um, stern upbringings mm. when they were children, very stern indeed, before the First World War and between the wars, from one's own family, you mm. know, how people were very strictly monitored mm. at home and in school, yet they didn't go out and start yes. sort of mm. behaving in an evil mm. way. Now, I'm not saying that that's, that's just one causal factor. There are all mm. sorts of causal factors. Uh, I'm less confident than Gwen is that there's no genetic component, for instance. Uh, I think that if one looks at, say, the difference between levels of violence in men and women, one wonders a bit whether there isn't an innate component. But I think it's something we have to... Yeah, I'm glad we're talking about this, because I mean, it really gets on my nerves when people say, you know, in the English and the British could have been just as fascistic as the Germans in the 30s and 40s. All the evidence is against that in any sensible, reasonable, relative sense, and yet it goes on. It's a kind of... It seems to me to be more than a canard. It seems to be to be just mistaking the way people behave. If that were true, then you, Gwen, would find that we were all capable of being the psychopaths who deal with at Broadmoor. Well, I, I, it, is, it, is a, it is a complex area, and to sort of collapse into sort of, you know, sort of simple cause and effect statements, I think, is, is to, in a way, to be responding to the anxiety that these type of questions raise. Because I, I, I think that there's a distinction between saying that everybody has the capacity 
to, to get into evil states of mind is quite different from saying everybody has the capacity to act evilly. And, and it's quite another to say that um, that, 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 would necessarily, that would necessarily happen. And I, I think that it's quite important to, to distinguish that. I mean, you, you, for example, you just take the question of early childhood experience. You're absolutely right that, that, that it's quite clear that only a proportion of people who are, for example, exposed to p- r- repetitive fear and humiliation as children go on to become perpetrators of violence in adulthood. However, it is equally true to say that nearly all the individual perpetrators of severe violence that we see in the hospital, and indeed in prisons too, nearly all of them have been exposed to <laughs> extremes of fear and violence in, in, in childhood. So that the, the equation is not a two, it's not a two-way equation. So I, I think, and I think what that tells us is that the developmental capacity to do these things is complicated and it's affected not only by child experience, not only by genes and, and the, what you just said about uh, gender, it draws in, it's, it's wildly provocative and perhaps we can come back to it. Um, but but I, I, I think that, I think that we, can't, we can't underestimate the, the question about political identity and, and whether the British could have been as fascistic. I mean, if we'd had a government like Hitler's, if we'd had... Um, well, we it, didn't. It, it, well, we didn't, but that's the point, isn't I mean, all we, Europe you know. was going fascist, and we got, we got one Mosley, and he was booed off Abs- the field. Abso- abso- absolutely. So I think, and I, so I think that if, if we had perhaps somehow got into that collective... I mean, there's nastiness around, there's anti-Semitism, and that's different from what was going on in, in Germany Abs- and Austria and Absolutely. Spain absolutely. and all over the place. But I think also to be, to, to be politically fascist, of course, is not, is not the same... As, as I don't think should be uh, um, uh, equivalent with the idea of being evil. I mean, this is not the same thing. There's something about there's something about a political identity which is not quite the same. I think this is moral identity. And the one thing, the other thing I would say, is that even if you thought that there was an intertwining of um, of experience in terms of victims and perpetrators, even if there's something that, that I mean, Primo Levi does talk about this. Both the oppressors and the victims need refuge and protection. But the point is that they both have a, they have a moral valence. That's quite different. And what we decide about them morally seems to me to be quite different. Jonathan? I I want to say two things. One is that we had a different history leading up to the 30s. We hadn't had the humiliation of defeat in the First World War and the economic collapse to the degree that Germany did. So it's a bit hard to tell how we would have behaved if we'd had that history. But the other thing is that I'm sure you're right that culture makes a difference. If one looks at the different occupied countries under the Nazis, one finds that the response to Nazism was very different. So it isn't just a matter of individual upbringing. Culture makes a huge difference. Jonathan Steinberg has a wonderful study of the difference between Italians and Germans, who both were officially on the same side, both officially committed to the policy of sending off the Jews, and the wonderful way in which the Italians, all the way down to the most humble soldier, had a history and tradition of resisting and refusing. So when the Nazis came to demand that the Italians rounded up the Jews, uh, they were given the runabout in all sorts of ways. They were told the orders hadn't come through yet. So they went to the Nazis went up to the higher people and they said, we can't understand how the orders haven't got through. In all sorts of ways, different cultures lead people to behave in different ways, and that's a very important factor. Yes, because they still managed to get rid of quite a few Jews from Italy, though, didn't they? They did, but not nearly to the same extent that happened in Germany or in Poland. Or in Hungary, yeah. You talk, uh, if the um, servants of evil regimes become embroiled in activities little by little, what if its leaders, how are they able to get away with it and to impose their will, Jonathan? I mean, we're talking about will, it brings us to Nietzsche quite soon, and, and, and Hitler did take from Nietzsche, said he's re- revealed something of the primal being in me, Nietzsche said, mm-hmm. uh, Hitler said of Nietzsche. But how do, how are lead, how do leaders figure in this, uh, in this equation? Well, leaders sometimes are, as I think Hitler was, virtually psychopathic. I mean, Hitler seems to me a person with absolutely no moral restraints. And I mean, all his preoccupation with morality was all about cleansing Germany from prostitutes and so on, as well as cleansing people from what he thought was racial impurity. Sometimes they're psychopaths who happen to get power in times of great crisis. Uh, Sometimes they're cold, fanatical ideologists, as Stalin was. Stalin, I think, wasn't, as it were, emotionally a psychopath, but was simply a person who, in a weird way, really believed in a system of belief which said that killing vast numbers of people was somehow the path to a better society. Hmm. You say, uh, you've said, uh, Gwen, that... um, 
we are born inhuman. That uh, and we have morality instilled in us through some empathy with our parents and so on. Well, I'm not. Yes, I'm not sure I would necessarily claim that people are born inhuman. I, I think that. Uh, I think. Well, never mind. I thought I was quoting you. Never, let's, well, but let's I, take the I, point. I, 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 I think there's something about perhaps acquiring the capacity to be human that I think it does happen as a, as a developmental task and continues to happen through life. And I, I don't think it's simply a feature as a, of childhood that continues to happen through life. And I think that what you've been describing in relation to Hitler and Stalin. You know, who, of course, have had sort of many sort of psychological autopsies uh, done done on them, and you know, and I think there is a very real question about whether it makes sense to look at to look at those men in terms of their individual psychopathology, because I don't because they they were historical creations, they were men in their time and their place, and they had political power, and I think that's important. But, but from what you were saying, from what from your studies and what you've, mm. you've observed, do, mm. do you think that that the, the idea? It goes back to the idea of original sin and before that, 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 that virtue has to be instilled is is very important. That if it isn't, then in the gap, uh, yes. uh, that will be I filled think, up I by think, uh, wickedness. I think uh, I think I, I, I think that virtue. I think that that virtue and certainly a moral identity does have to be acquired, and that um, and the capacity to be human. Is, some, is, is, is an acquired capacity. I think it may be that the capacity is innate in, in, in everyone, but for it to flourish, to use an Aristotelian term, and to, for it to be fully developed is a developmental task that takes a whole lifetime, and some people never achieve it, and some, some people never achieve it, some people only achieve it partially, some, and a very few people, I think, never achieve it at all. But those people, I think, are very rare, and we don't see them all that often. The people that I work with more are usually people who've, who've lost their capacity, their capacity for interpersonal relating to be human has been diminished or whittled away in some way, just like Hitler and Stalin. I think. The, uh, there are some people, Jonathan Lover, who think that the um, godlessness of the 20th century, the comparative godlessness, has been a huge contributing factor to the barbarism. What's your view of that? I think the evidence goes both ways. I mean, first it should be said that, of course, belief in God can lead to fanaticism, intolerance, cruelty, crusades, and so on. And I speak here as an atheist with some feeling. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm also aware that many of the people who behaved most bravely and courageously did so on grounds of principled religious commitment. And as a non-religious believer, I see one of the central human tasks is to, be, to create a way of being moral that doesn't require appeal to religious authority. When I said at the start of the programme, I, I just recited a few statistics about the millions and millions that have been killed in this century. You, re, re, your riposte was, well, there's been barbarism every century, with which I agreed, and the, the, the increase in numbers is larger to do with technology. So do you actually think that human uh, nature has not become more unleashed this century, that there's a steady... Uh, pulse of wickedness which is goes in a more or less regular rate throughout the centuries and what's happened now is it's just hit the fan because of the atom bombs and, and capacities for getting people to concentration camps and, and well, that sort of thing. it may fluctuate over time. I think people mm. have always had both a capacity for great evil and a capacity for great moral heroism and goodness. Uh, what I do think is that technology provides circumstances in which it's far easier for large numbers of people to do really terrible things because the effects of what they do are at a distance and invisible. Mm. I think communication has something to do. The, the other changes have been this century have something to do with, with communication, the fact that you can spread your message about the, uh, the evilness of your, of your victim. Um, you can spread that message very, very easily. It can be transported, um, and I think that's one thing. And I wonder whether there's also been a sort of an engagement with images of violence this century that there, that there perhaps wasn't um, in, in previous centuries, that it's possible, particularly through television and through the cinema, to see depictions of, of, of violence and, and, and have an image, be presented with an image of violence in a very rigid way, rather like the, with the way that you describe in your book, Jonathan, where you describe very a rigid polarised, the, 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 
the aggressive, violent, triumphant person and the victim, the victims who, who, dis- who just disappear. But curious enough, yeah. one of the most vivid examples of, of, of inexplicable violence recently in Rwanda was, was more than encouraged by the radio. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Though I want to say that in one way the media of mass communications do provide us with some hope because mm. there's also the sense, that the very, for the very first time in history really, there's a sense of a kind of world public opinion which is starting to find atrocities mm. intolerable so that when atrocities happen in Kosovo or in East Timor, there's a widespread sense that something has to be done. Mm -hmm. Now, what is done is not always effective and sometimes arguably misguided and at considerable cost. But I think we're seeing the beginnings of a a shared human consciousness that we are aware that all this is going on all over the world now as soon as it happens. And as a result, there's some hope that we might start to shape institutions that would curb and control it. See, I think it's interesting you say that, because I, I, I think you're right, because I think that Shel- Shelley talked about, just as you do actually, Shelley talked about the imagination being an instrument for moral, for moral, for good. And I wonder whether, the, and I can think of a man that I work with in a hospital who's used his imagination both for good and for terrible evil. He has used his creativity both to be a beautiful artist and create beautiful things, but also to be an appalling sadist. And I wonder whether that what we have to struggle with perhaps in the next century is something about how we use our imagination and the images that we fill our imagination with, how we use our imagination profoundly affects, I think, how we act. Shelley said that the poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. And I was surprised after I'd finished my book to find how much more often I'd quoted poets than philosophers. Absolutely. Can we come back uh, in in talking of quotations to uh, a quotation I used when trailing this program from Nietzsche over a hundred years ago, uh, where he said, there can be no doubt that morality will gradually perish. This is the great spectacle in a hundred acts reserved for the next two centuries in Europe. He does seem to have been on the right track if you just look at the evidence, Jonathan. Well... He thought that the death of God, which he believed in, and he believed that that God had died, there wasn't a credible belief anymore, he thought that would mean the collapse of the Judeo-Christian morality, and he thought that would be both terrifying and wonderful. My belief is that we ought to try and keep certain key aspects of Judeo-Christian morality about loving our neighbour, about caring for other people, instead of the sort of ruthless struggle that Nietzsche believed in. Uh, We ought to try and develop that kind of morality in a way that doesn't depend upon a religious authority, which many of us now can't accept. Do you see any, going, do you see any evidence that we can do that, that we're in control enough to do that, that people would be responsive to, th- to that being encouraged in them? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. No, I, I, I do. Because coming back to this question about innateness and, and about being how I'm born in human or human, I think that, that what we do know is that um, we have an innate drive to relate to each other. We actually, there is an innate drive, I think, to, to make relationships with people. We're not born to be alone. Well, and those it, relationships that, can be a war, can't they? Uh, they, ca- they uh, I think that the, the, the challenge then is what we make of those relationships and how we treat others, particularly the vulnerable. Thank you very much. We've been talking around the book Humanity, A Moral History of the 20th Century by Jonathan Glover with Gwen Adshead. Thank you for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4. Radio 4. Radio 4. Radio 4. Radio 4. Radio 4. Radio 4.